approach from a copper. Likewise, with Troy, the character you see on the screen is quite different from how he appears in the books. In the novels, Troy is an amazing creation, as far removed from Tom Barnaby's character as the North Pole is from the equator. The character was softened and made more attractive to a TV audience. It is true there were hints of his original red-top attitude, but they weren't ingrained or obvious enough to be character-defining. In fact, he became a lovable character in the television show, and it must be said that, despite the simplification involved, Troy remains one of the best-loved characters in Midsummer. In Caroline's novels, unlike the television series, the size of the social canvas is vast, with a huge variety of characters from all social classes, the lords and ladies, the poor, the young, the old, the disadvantaged, the indulged, the psychotic, the deranged, the loved and the unloved. The lives of all these characters are intimately and entertainingly delineated and explored. The murder mysteries are character-led, in a way that the television versions are very often not. The television plots concentrate almost exclusively on the exotic methods of murder, rather than the character of those who commit them. They have succeeded on this level beyond all expectation, but there is always a price to pay for turning books into a television series. Very often, the human interest is lost in the pursuit of ever more lurid and sometimes ludicrous plot lines. And while the results of this chase can be as entertaining as they are popular, something essential to good whodunit storytelling is undoubtedly lost. But despair not. In Caroline's books, you will find that humanity restored, the drama therefore more real, and the satisfaction absolute. Enjoy. John Nettles, July 2016She had been walking in the woods just before tea time when she saw them. Walking very quietly, although that had not been her intention. It was just that the spongy underlay of leaf mold and rotting vegetation muffled every footfall. The trees, tall and packed close together, also seemed to absorb sound. In one or two places, the sun pierced through the closely entwined branches, sending dazzling shafts of hard white light into the darkness below. Miss Simpson stepped in and out of these shining beams, peering at the ground. She was looking for the spurred, coral-root orchid. She and her friend, Lucy Bellringer, had discovered the first nearly fifty years ago, when they were young women. Seven years had passed before it had surfaced again, and then it had been Lucy who had spotted it, diving off into the undergrowth with a hoot of triumph. Their mock feud had developed from that day. Each summer they set out, sometimes separately, sometimes together, eager to find another specimen. Hopes high, eyes sharp, and notebooks and pencils at the ready, they stalked the dim beechwoods. Whoever spotted the plant first gave the loser, presumably as some sort of consolation prize, a spectacularly high tea. The orchid flowered rarely, and due to an elaborate system of underground rhizomes, not always in the same place twice. Over the last five years, the two friends had started looking earlier and earlier. Each was aware the other was doing so. Neither ever mentioned it. Really thought Miss Simpson, parting a clump of bluebells gently with her stick. Another couple of years at this rate, and will be coming out when the snow's on the ground. But if there was any justice in the world, and Miss Simpson firmly believed that there was, then 1987 was her turn. Lucy had won in 1969 and 1978, but this year... She tightened her almost colourless lips. She wore her old leghorn hat, with the bee veil pushed back, a faded Horrocks's cotton dress, wrinkled white Lyle stockings, and rather baggy, green-stained tennis shoes. She was holding a magnifying glass and a sharp stick with a red ribbon tied to it. She had covered almost a third of the wood.
which was a small